Welcome to School Day at the North Texas Teen Book Festival. This event is hosted by the Library Science Program at Sam Houston State University's College of Education. I am Angie Maholik, the librarian at Coppell Middle School West in Coppell, Texas, and a proud alum of Sam Houston State University's Library Science Program. Today, I am honored to moderate the Flights of Fantasy panel with the wonderful Marjorie Liu, Alex London, and Pam Munoz Ryan. I know our viewers can't wait to hear from our featured authors. So would each of you please share a little about yourself and your newest book? Um, can we begin with you, Marjorie? Oh, sure. Um, everyone, thank you so much for having me here tonight or today. Um, my name is Marjorie and I'm a former attorney um, who spent many, many years writing romance and urban fantasy novels. And then I started writing comics for Marvel, um, like Black Widow, uh, the X-Men, and then I made the jump to indie comics. Uh, and so Wing Bear is my first graphic novel for young readers. It's a fantasy adventure about a young girl named Zuli who has grown up literally between worlds. Um, she was raised in an otherworldly tree where bird spirits go to be reborn. Um, but when those spirits suddenly stop arriving, um, Zuli has to journey into the real world to discover what's happening to the birds and, you know, hopefully learn more about her past. Okay. Pam, would you like to share? Sure. Um, I'm Pam Munoz Ryan. I, many of you might be familiar with my middle grade novel, novels like Esperanza Rising or Echo and in The Dreamer, Manana Land, though, and through all of those books, you'll find a lot of magical realism. And, um, and my magical realism seems to just be kind of migrating closer and closer and closer to fantasy in recent years. So, which is really, really fun and really a departure for me, but um, it's also sort of a, a way to stretch and to, to grow. And Solomar, um, Solomar, the Sword of the Monarchs is a middle grade um, novel. It is, um, on a, <clears throat> I was approached by Disney to write an original Latina princess story. And she is um, about to uh, become 15 years old and have a quinceanera in her kingdom. She's very frustrated because her brother will ascend the throne at some point and be king and she will not. And she sees the need for a lot of change and she's very persistent. Um, she's very fascinated with the monarch butterfly migration and she wants to be there every year when they first arrive. And one year when she is there, they. Um, there's a, some butterfly magic and they infuse her reposo with magic that becomes a gift and a huge burden. So that gives you an idea. Okay, thank you. And Alex, last but not least. Hi, I'm Alex London. Uh, I'm the author of a, a lot of books. I, I started my career as a, a journalist and human rights work uh, researcher around the world and um, got burned out on that and became a young adult librarian, which was the best job ever. And uh, I bring that up purely <laughs> to pander for the educators here um, that I'm a, a former librarian uh, who, then, who then started writing books for young people and my newest uh, series, Battle Dragons. Uh, it's kind of right there in the title. Um, <laughs> who battle? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a very condensed version of that. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's a uh, battle dragons is set in a sort of futuristic city um, uh, where built around dragons. Dragons are everywhere in this city. They're the taxis. They're the buses. They're the garbage incinerators. They do everything. Uh, they are also ridden by law enforcement and ridden by the various gangs called kin that control the criminal underworld of this city. And at night, in illegal dragon battles, these kins uh, fight on dragon back for control of the criminal underworld. And uh, our young hero, Abel, is in seventh grade and he's failed his Dragon Rider Academy exam. Uh, unlike his older brother, who's a star cadet, unlike his older sister, who, who did so well on it and then opted not to go to the Dragon Rider Academy and instead works in a comic book shop, much to the parents' chagrin. Um, <laughs> he failed and feels like a loser and like he's never going to get to ride an awesome dragon. Uh, and he loves dragons until one night uh, when his sister shows up at his window uh, when she's not supposed to be outside uh, and tells him to keep something safe. And he doesn't know what that is, but with the help of his friends, he discovers it's a stolen dragon. His sister is a notorious dragon thief. His brother is actually an undercover 
uh, operative for the Dragon's Eye, the police force, and is after her. And Abel is caught up in a war between all the different kin and is going to decide where his loyalties are and if he can learn to master this giant stolen dragon and whose side he's going to be on. And that is Battle Dragons, the first book in the Battle Dragons series. Yo, I'm ready. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. I think you should come and do all of my book talks for me. And yeah. <laughs> my favorite thing about being a librarian was book talks. Could you do, could you do mine? <laughs> I will. I, will. <laughs> I have to say something triggered me with his when he was talking about the world because, you know, magical realism, I've been doing that for a long time and it just always sort of rides the fence. But what's really been a departure for me is the world building. And when I hear you talking, Alex, and, you know, Marjorie about the your worlds, I, you know, one thing I've realized is how hard it is and what a challenge it is to, to keep everything straight. And you almost have to make a Bible, right? To make, to keep like your, like all the rules, the rules and the magic. And the other thing I've just discovered is magic is hard. You know, I mean, it, right? Yeah. It's super, I mean, it has to oddly make sense, right? <laughs> It does. And then also there's always the risk of overpowering your character. Right. You know? yeah. So, and then you, have, you know, so you have to find that right balance where the character isn't so powerful that they can just literally solve all, you know, every problem with the snap of their right. fingers, but also that there's enough magic, you know, there's enough magic that is interesting, but then there's room for conflict. Yes. How do you manage that? Giving, giving your characters power and, and controlling it. I'm so curious how other people do that. Well, there, it seems like there has to be like, you know, if they do this, then this happens. You know, there it seems like there has to be a lot of consequences for certain things, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Consequences. You know, there's a price for everything. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I don't actually have magic in mind. And it's just dragons. So I'm like, yeah. I totally believe so. I'm, you don't have I'm, to worry. I'm, yeah, no. I'm going. I'm totally on board. I'm so. I mean, I've written magic systems before, and it's so hard that I'm like, no magic, just dragons. <laughs> <laughs> so, does somebody want to tell Alex that dragons are magical? Or <laughs> well, no. So here, hey, I, I, but, you know, <laughs> so I, I think. Excuse me. Dragons are power, right? Like in any. Right. Any culture that has invented some version of a dragon, it's, I think, a reflection of what power the people creating it want to think about or wish for or problematize. And I think power ultimately doesn't change a person. I think it reveals a person. So I kind of thought, what a great way to reveal all of my characters in this world, from my anxious seventh grader to my gangsters and their parents and all those people. Like, I'll give them a dragon, and then we'll really know who they are. Like, what you <laughs> dragon's back? That'll tell us something about who you are. And you know, another uh, great series like um, of books where, and you know, where uh, there were dragons, but no magic, was uh, was Pern. Oh right, uh -huh. the dragon. And, you know, and, it, and as you point out, Alex, it was power. You know, it was these were these were tools for, for fighting. You know, this this otherworldly menace, but um, but it had nothing to do with magic. It was just technology. Yeah. And isn't that, in a way, the subject of all our books, even when we're not writing magic? Or yeah, books? absolutely. I love it. So I'm going to start with a question from one of our viewers. Amy from Jasper High School would love to ask, thinking back to your favorite books from childhood, in which fantasy worlds would you wish to live? So does someone want to start first? I mean, I know mine right off the bat. Okay, you can go. Red wall. For oh, yes. oh, I'm good pretty, one. I want the feast. I don't want to like get my fur flayed off by a one eyed rat with a whip tail, but I do, or like chopped in half by an angry badger, but I do want to eat those feasts. Um, yeah. You know, I really love the Valdemar books by Mercedes Lackey. Those I love, you know, the, for me as a little girl, the idea of having a, a horse that I was psychically bonded to, <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. And it, following that theme, there was a shared universe of books written by different authors that came out in the 90s. Um, and they were about um, Amazons in another universe that rode unicorns. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Cannot read um, like the secret of the unicorn queen, uh -huh. something like that. But um, but that just took me away to a completely different world, and there was nothing I wanted more. Than, and you see where the theme is. I was horse crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so between between unicorn uh -huh. and like talking magical horses that I'm I'm telepathically linked to, that was uh -huh. my jam. I have to say that mine was a little bit different and maybe a little bit more old fashioned, but. I was completely obsessed with Greek myths and also with the original Grimm's, not the sound, not not the tidy Grimm's fairy tales, the um, the original Grimm's that are um, grim. <laughs> they, you know, they and so the fantasy and the and the and the worlds, you know, the the in, the worlds of the Greek myths and the worlds of um, the original versions of the fairy tales. I I was totally absorbed. That's it, because things don't go well for young women in either of those. No, no, they, and um, yeah, and there's a lot of, um, you know, it, it's it's really there's a, a lot of um, I don't know destruction and um, you know there's a lot of uh, people getting hurt and losing limbs and all sorts of things. Eyes, but, um, a lot of lost eyes, right? A lot of lost eyes, but um, I don't know. I was totally enthralled with the Greek myths and the original Grimm's. Yeah. So uh, Marjorie, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, you kind of alluded to this in your intro, but you are not only a New York Times bestselling author, but also an attorney. And I know that so many of our viewers struggle with that pressure from their families to be a doctor or a lawyer, but actually have the desire and talent to be a writer. So would you share a little more about your journey with us? Okay, well, you know, um, so how do I put this? Um, uh, life can sometimes be a, a, a set of challenges um, that sometimes involve us overcoming the opinions of other people who think they know what's best for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I, I certainly understand the pressure of, um, of wanting to be... Um, I certainly understand the pressure of, of families um, wanting us to be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, I experienced that. Um, I also understand why they want their kids to be um, doctors or lawyers you know, instead of artists. It's very safe. And, and on a practical level, I am 100% on board with that because I'm like, when I was a young person, even though I dreamed of being a writer, I knew it wasn't practical. And I never thought of it as a real job. Um, it really wasn't until law school that I decided to take a chance to write a book and simply see what might happen. Um, I, you know, the, the thing that mattered most was that I was really passionate about it. And I, and I also wasn't staking my future on it either. It was just something that I loved and I really, really needed to express that love, um, you know, no matter what the outcome would be. Um, the thing is, I actually got really lucky. You know, I had no connections. I had no agent. Um, I submitted my novel um, through the slush pile and an editorial assistant found it and then brought it to the editor who liked it and bought it. And that's how I got my start. And it's, it's been almost 20 years. And so, you know, but the key to that story again is that I was doing something I really, really loved. And so for the first time in my life, um, I really allowed myself to indulge in a passion. And that passion was just an extension of my love of reading. Um, and I think it's really important to stress for young people that, uh, that, that this isn't just a one-way street of wanting to be an artist, you know, and people telling them no. Um, it's any dream, right? You know, there are probably just as many young people who want to be doctors or scientists or pilots who have adults telling them, um, you know, that their grades aren't good enough, they're not smart enough, like whatever it is. And the question always is, how does one move past that to see beyond our families or our friends to who we are and who we dream ourselves to be? You know, how do we get the courage, um, you know, whether we're young or old, to have faith in ourselves and to also open ourselves up to being okay um, if the chances we take don't go as planned? Like you have to kind of teach yourself um, how to swerve in a new direction. You know, how do we remind ourselves that like changes don't have to be immediately radical? 
right? But they can start as small as, in, for me, it started as small as indulging um, a passion for reading. And that's where it started. It wasn't this like big radical shift in my life. It was it started just with books. And then one day I just started writing stories down and it was just this little thing that built and built and built until, you know, all these years later, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's so important for so many of our students to hear. So continuing with that, Pam, I know you have written so many books, many that have received prestigious awards. And um, our students are always asking about the writing process. And we would love to hear about your process. Do you begin with an outline? Do you have a specific process that you like to follow? Um, I'm, I'm a very recursive writer. I, for me, it's much more of an evolution than it is a tidy, tidy process. It's a, a very messy evolution. I usually start in a scene. I usually have the characters in mind. I, that first scene usually is always stays the same for some reason for, and I write and I, the next day I go back to the beginning and I reread, you know, I rewrite, um, I add more the next day I go back to the beginning and for me it's that evolution I usually know how the story is going to start I usually know the emotional resolution or what or, or the resolution that I want at the end but I usually don't have a clue how I'm I'm going to get there so I'm often as surprised as anyone as the story uh, evolves and um and I, you know, I, I don't call myself a writer as much as I call myself a rewriter because those earlier drafts are nothing more than something to fix, something to change and something to make better. And I always like to tell students not to measure me and teachers too, not to measure me on, you know, my successes are the tip of an iceberg of hundreds of starting overs. And, um, you know, so um, that's my process. And then of course it, it, eventually gets to a point where I can't always go back to the beginning, but I always going back, start, you know, on a daily basis, three or four chapters and reading and rewriting and adding more and moving, inching, inching forward. So I, I go with the messy evolution <laughs> version of writing. Marjorie, Alex, do you have something different, similar? What do you like? What do you prefer? Mine is frighteningly similar, but I'm, yeah. I'm actually comforted, <laughs> yeah. I'm comforted to hear that's your way because yeah. I'm often very clueless about what comes next and I have to go back and over and over. And I'll sometimes have like, oh, well, I, I'm very visual. So like like you, Pam, I'll, I'll know like a scene and I can see uh, it. I in have my a scene. Head. It's like a movie. Yeah. You're watching a yeah. movie. Yeah. 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 Um, but then I often don't know what's happening next or why. Um, and hopefully I know where I want it to end. Usually it's more like emotionally where I want the characters yes, to be. Yes, exactly. Maybe something I want them to know, uh, but how they learn that and why they feel that way about it, I don't quite know and stuff has to happen. And sometimes I'll have like a cool moment I know I want to get to uh, yeah. at some point, especially when you're writing a dragon series. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> you've got to do certain things. Um, so I jotted in a notebook right when I started Battle Dragons. And this is there's a lot of like deep emotional stuff in the book, but there's also things like dragon parkour which uh which is a random thing i wrote i was like well, i don't know what that means yet or why it would be necessary but i gotta make it happen at some point for some reason i gotta earn that um and i could it wasn't until the third book in the series which isn't out for i don't even know supply chain stuff when the third book is coming oh. out. but it wasn't until the third book that i was able to write my dragon parkour scene but i knew i wanted to make this awesome oh. moment happen but my character wasn't ready for it yet <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the, the same. I mean, you know, Alex, Pam, like I, um, I always start with the first sentence. Um, I mean, when I was writing novels, I always started with the first sentence. And that first sentence was always incredibly propulsive. Like it would just, there was something, I always worked really hard on that first sentence because for me, it would just contain everything um, that I needed to sort of just push forward into the story. Um, and in comics, I try to do the same thing with the first page. For me, mm -hmm. a, a, a first page, not just for readers, but for me as the writer, I need a really propulsive first page to get me going through the process. And so, and it's, it is super organic. I don't know what's going to happen. Characters are always surprising me. Um, you know, I guess if I had to, if I had to break it, really break it down, 
Um, and it, I would say there's the dreaming process and there's the practical process. Um, you know, uh, I get, uh, probably it sounds like self-explanatory, but you know, my ideas are really, you know, tend to be like sound bites with no um, narrative punch. So like girl is friend with monsters, um, you know, a uh, girl has to save the souls of birds, you know, which has no story. It's just, it's just a line, but it's there to kind of get me thinking. And so the key for me is always to carve that idea, to carve that dream, to carve that sentence into like this living thing, this living structure, which almost never happens overnight. Um, you know, Wing Bear took me over 10 years to understand. Um, I had to become a different writer. I, you know, a different person to write that book, uh, which could never have happened without those 10 years of completely different work and personal growth. And, I, you know, the dream to story process is as much about figuring out a story as it is understanding who I am and have become, um, even at an unconscious level. You know, the practical process after all that is really just me sitting down and letting and just letting the brain and the heart and whatever it is just take over and just take that idea some like you said scenes a vague idea of what I want to have happen and then just and then just turn it on and just go. Yep. I yep. <laughs> I always talk when I talk in schools. I talk to the kids about the the practical stuff of writing that is not all writing novels anyway. It's not all that mysterious. You know, you can learn how to construct a sentence. <laughs> And learn how to create a character. You can learn how to build a chapter and a paragraph and use details and use your senses. And then there's the other side that yeah. is just as, if not more important, which is the being open mm -hmm. and receptive and thinking about your emotions and other people's and how they interact mm -hmm. and why and feeling them and letting something flow through you. And it sounds always weird when authors try and talk about it because well, it's, so, it's so big. I always tell people, they always want to know what's, you know, you know, what's the most important thing you can, or what kind of advice can you give me? And I always tell people momentum is far more important than inspiration. Uh, oh, oh that, that's, that's so true. It's that's the so physical, true. it's the physical revisiting yeah. of the manuscript and being in the manuscript day after day and going back to it. That's where the creativity like, yeah. come. like I have these two darling muses in my office that somebody gave me and they're they're pretty but they're useless you know I mean I think people think that I think people think that it's just this it just comes to you and it's just like you know and then you just put it but it's the momentum of continually revisiting your manuscript and being in that place I think is where the real creativity comes where, where it where it sort of that's where the seeds of the creative cre creativity come from. I also like to think, I also think there's a lot of reweaving. So yeah. you, we, you, when you, well, the way the three of us write, when you, you start in that scene, you don't really know, you know, I always kind of equate it to the overture of a, of a musical or, you know, of a, of a, of a piece of music where like, you know, you'll hear all the little threads of the, of the music that you're going to hear later all through the show. But that, so that's like the foreshadowing. So I feel like all that has to be there in that first chapter, but I don't know what's coming. So then I have to go back and reweave, right? Yeah. I mean, Pam, what you said earlier about like having so many different starts, so many different oh, yeah. versions, so I, it's the same for me. Like I remember um, working on a novel and just going with the flow and just being in that flow and following that book and then waking up one day and just realizing went down the wrong way. Got to <laughs> turn around, got to go back, yeah. got to find a different path. And on one hand, I was frustrated, but on the other hand, it was just an excuse to go deeper into the characters. It was an excuse to live longer into the in the world. Sometimes you we use little pieces of it, right? Yeah. yeah. None of it's yeah. wasted. Yeah. It's never wasted. No. Never wasted, you know, yeah. Like you don't, like I'm not a surfer, but I'm about to make a surfing uh, analogy for some <laughs> Well, my, my son's no surfing, so let's, let's hear it. <laughs> let's hear, maybe this isn't true, but I have a thing, yeah. you know, I was a, a, a gay kid who could own surfing magazines, never been surfing in my life, but I sure liked surfing magazines because that was a safe <laughs> So, you know, um, so I had a lot of surfing <laughs> magazines in my teenage years or something. No one ever questioned, like, you're not a surfer. But so I know a little about surfing from the shirtless guys. Uh -huh. um, but <laughs> no surfer, I think, uh, ever 
rides a wave that isn't great or whatever and afterwards says i regret riding that wave right you every, <laughs> no, every wave right. you ride. yeah um and you learn something and you experience something every draft you go down and every sentence you write even if it doesn't make it and if you don't catch it you just paddle back out yeah right yeah. <laughs> keep paddling and hope a shark doesn't eat you but you know that's actually just a really just just to keep pushing that like writing it is it is like riding a wave it and also but but I don't know man sometimes and this is gonna sound maybe you know when I don't know how it is for the the two of you but sometimes when I'm writing a book whether it's a novel or a graphic novel whatever it is it does feel like riding the surface of something really massive and mysterious you know it is like uh -huh. being on the ocean and it, being an explorer not quite knowing where you're going to end up, but knowing that there's something really vast and beautiful beneath you. And that if you're just patient, you're going to pull something up. That's just that astonishing. Like, that's just like, ugh, like, you know, something you've never seen before. Somebody said to me once that they, they didn't like to, they didn't like to swim in the ocean because they, they, they only wanted to swim in a pool. They didn't like to swim in the ocean because they couldn't see what was beneath them. And, and I always thought that was such a great <laughs> analogy for writing, because like, we, we can't see what's beneath us, right? <laughs> that is a good analogy. I like that. Mm -hmm. So so that being said, Alex, with Battle Dragons, um, you've built this city with numerous dragons. How do you organize all of them? What do you, how do you keep traffic, track of them? I mean, do you have like the database of dragons? Right. So yeah, a more, a more organized writer would like have a whole like system. I was, I essentially started from a place of so like, reassured. What would, like what would be cool? Um, what could I do that's cool? Uh, and how does that in, impact things? And so I started there and realized this is going to get messy fast. I mean, there are thousands of different dragons in this series so i had to after i started kind of invent a taxonomy so i don't have like a whole bible but i did create a document that has a taxonomy of the types of dragons the long wings who do a certain kind of work the medium wings and the short wings i decided it was all based on wingspan and then within that there's different dragons and then it really was thinking of okay can i is there something cool here that i can do and how would how would that impact things so i spent a lot of time asking myself, what if, and then, but why? Um, which is, I think, a lot of what, like, I don't, I'm not a scientist either. I'm neither a surfer nor a scientist. But I imagine scientists spend a lot of time saying, so what if, and but why? And that was what I did in creating the dragons. And sometimes I would create something, and the what if made the whole city fall apart, or it was too powerful, or it was too weird, or the but why made no sense. <laughs> um, so I'd have to go back and change. But mostly it was, okay, does this fit what I've created? If not, is there an interesting reason it doesn't fit? And can that impact the world uh, of battle dragons? And if it does fit, cool, let's use it and see what awesome things can happen with it. Uh, so like I created this dragon called a bone reaper, purely because oh. that sounded cool. And then I thought, what does that mean? And then I determined it was a dragon that had translucent skin and scales. So when it was lying still, it looked like just a pile of dragon bones. And you thought, oh, cool. And then you got close to it and it sits up. And that's scary. And then it shoots instead of fire, it actually shoots fragments of bone at you. So they're preceded by a cracking sound. And if you pay attention, you can realize, oh, that cracking sound is a warning. It's about to spit bones at me. I can dodge it and stuff. Um, they sound scary. They turn out to be delightful dragons, but they, they do seem kind of scary at first to our hero. Um, but so like it started with just a cool name and then I had to think, okay, like what does that mean? And why does it exist? And how can I make that more interesting? Um, but yeah, I'm not organized. So I have a messy document and I have the eye color. Writing down, when you write a series, write down your characters <laughs> and especially your thousands of dragons, what color their eyes are. Oh. I always that. And my poor you copy well, you know what? You know what I do sometimes? I, after I've described a character, I'll go look, I'll put in all of its characteristics and images and see if I can find the character. And then I print those out and put them up on, and sometimes I find exactly the character that I had written. I mean, what they look like. Yeah. Do you understand? And you can do that with people. It's hard to do yeah, with fantasy no, dragons. Yeah. 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 I well, do that with I, people, actually. Have you tried to look on images for your... <laughs> for my dragons? For dragons? I, I've played yeah. around, but... but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're tough. But I do the same with people. I will find, like, actors. I'll, like, cast the movie in my head. Yeah. 
I guess that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so Marjorie, you know, we have so many graphic novel fans watching. Um, would you give us some insight into the collaborative partnership between both the author and the illustrator? Oh man, it's beautiful. Um, I, listen, the great pleasure and privilege of writing a graphic novel um, for me has always been um, that I'm working with these wonderful artists um, and I'm not lonely when I'm writing a comic. Um, which, you know, like it's when you're writing a novel, you know, it's you're by yourself, you're right, you know, it's there's the, there's not an immediate um, audience, you're living in your head, it's, it's not, I, it, not that I ever felt like, you know, it's, you, I'm surrounded by characters, but it's a different thing when you're writing for another person, and that's what a script is, you're writing, I'm writing for the artist, um, because I'm writing for this person who's going to bring the story to life, and who's collaborating on this narrative journey with me, and it's, it's kind of this, um, I remember the first time I ever collaborated with an artist was at Marvel Comics. And I'd never done this before. Um, you know, I wrote a script, I turned it in, started talking with the artist, um, then pages started coming back and it was like magic. It was really, really like magic. I, I fell in love just immediately, immediately with this, this process of creating for this medium in which I could, um, work with people who are just so talented who can bring worlds to life. Um, practically speaking, you know, huh? see the art. Oh, sorry. Did you, I'm really curious? Did you get to see the art as you went along, like just in the whole process? You it got depends. To see it. Oh. it depends. So, like for example, at Marvel, um, you know, sometimes you would see pages as they as they would come in. Um, sometimes you would just see layouts, and then you would just see the final pages. Um, with Wing Bear, um, we saw the layouts, and the thing about mm -hmm. Tenny. Um, you know, Tenny Isakanyan, who's my artist on Wing Bear, who's amazing. Um, she did full layouts of the entire book. And then the pages, the finished pages would just start rolling in. And so, uh, you know, randomly, it was like just uh, like random Christmas throughout the year where you would just, you just open up your email and be like, oh, <laughs> here we are. Um, and, you know, the thing is, practically speaking, though, like I, I, I write scripts. But I always try to keep my scripts pretty simple so that the artists have room to play. Um, they have room to express themselves. And so I'll do basic panel descriptions, you know, a few world or character notes. Um, dialogue is always a huge thing for me because for me, I feel like a lot gets expressed through dialogue, a lot of story, and then also all the emotional beats that matter. Um, so I make sure those are in the scripts that I, I send out. Um, and then the artist just interprets those words into visuals. You know, for example, Tenny, she created the visuals of Wing Bear, you know, everything from landscapes to the flora and fauna, to the clothing, to how different creatures look from the griffins to the manticores. Um, and it was really stunning watching her process and watching how the world evolved in her hands. And, you know, like, and so that's one side of it. And there's the other side where, you know, with other artists I've worked with, um, they will turn in, you know, I'll be working on a story. It's this, it's the same process of not quite know where I'm not knowing where I'm going, but um, I'll be working on a story. And, and for example, on Monstrous, my artist Sana will, um, she will turn in a character sketch and I will see this character and I will be like, that character was not supposed to be part of the story, except for just like one page. And now they're going to be a major part of the story because uh, the art you know, brings um, people to life. And suddenly you can, you can see sort of, you know, their, their full potential and how they can bring life to the story. Um, and so it's this really beautiful exchange of ideas, uh, just visuals of inspiration. Um, it's a very organic process that's, that's, a, um, that's alive. It's like, it's, it's very, it's, it's very alive process that I love. Thank you. I know yeah. that's very important to so many of our students who are enjoying our graphic novels, and um, I appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam, uh, many of your novels have been used by our teachers to support their curriculum and instruction. Do you have any advice, words of encouragement you would like to share with our educators that are watching today? I'm sorry, um, they're used for, um, I, I missed that part. With the curriculum used, and in their classroom. Well, curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, oh well, I, I I'm really grateful that they that they use it. First of all, thank you for that. Um, 
most of my fan mail begins, I was forced to read, you know, your book for eighth grade English or seventh grade English. But so thank you so much, teachers. Um, I, I, I have to tell you that I'm just always really impressed and amazed. Like, I just think they, the activities that they create and the curriculum that they create is always takes it to a level that I, I would have never thought of. So I'm really grateful for that. And I love, especially when they use my books as read alouds and, and, um, and so I would more than anything, tell them, thank you. And I don't, they, you know, I'm not a writing teacher. I'm always amazed if, when you go someplace and they want to know if you could teach writing, I could tell you what I do, but we have our, you know, we have schools filled full of teachers who have, you know, who have um, gone through the national writing project project and have far more skills at, at teaching their children. I have to, our children, I have to say that it's really interesting to me Number one, that I write now for the age I was when books made the most profound difference in my life, um, that fifth through ninth grade. And um, I also um, want to compliment um, the teachers for, for how, they, how they use my books and how they really extend the experience. Um, I also wanted to tell you, just because we were talking about graphic novels, that I just finished the script for the graphic novel for Esperanza Rising. And it's being illustrated right now, and um, that was such a an amazing experience. And I and so different, and such a <laughs> um, a jumping off place for me. So that was really fun. Oh, Pam, I'm really happy for you. It's fun, isn't it? So fun. Well, I already had it, and I didn't. I was not like. I think for you, that's even to me so much. I mean, I already had the whole book. You know, I had the book to go by. So I I wasn't you know, creating characters as I went along. But um, it, it was really interesting. I did, you know, I did get, do it in panels, but I basically, when we gave it to the illustrator, we're like, you know, this this is not a template. This is just a jumping off place, you know, I, because I've worked with, pic, with picture book illustrators many times and, you know, they're gonna say things with the art that becomes redundant if my words are on the page. So yeah. my feeling is take my words off the page, right? at that point so so well, i'm really happy for you congratulations um marjorie do you want to share something that you're working on now um so i wrote this i finished writing the sequel to wing bear um and um i am writing a new graphic novel series that i i guess i'm not really supposed to talk about but that will be <laughs> <laughs> so i guess i won't but it'll be launching sometime this year um yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, writing the sequel to Wing Bear was a really joyful experience. Um, I really loved being back in that world with Zuli and her friends and 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 getting to explore more griffins. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what's the plural of Pegasus? Pegasi? Pegasuses? Oh. Pegasuses? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, anyway, you know, there are Pegasuses. In this book, I don't know. <laughs> more winged creatures expanding the world. Um, and that's been a real joy. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And Alex, something that you're working on? So I just finished the uh, the third Battle Dragons book. So the trilogy written during this last two years of the pandemic. Started it the week everything shut down and finished it <laughs> a little bit ago. Um, though I'm hoping there'll be a fourth book. We're still figuring that out. Uh, and I'm playing around with some new ideas. I've got some TV stuff that I'm not allowed to say anything about that I'm I'm hoping to, to pay. I'm hoping it will take more time soon than it has. Um, uh, so I've been playing around with that Excellent. form of writing scripts and things, which is really an interesting uh, an interesting thing to do, especially taking something that's been in my head as a book and be like, how do I turn this into a, something else in a different form? Mm -hmm. that that is weird <laughs> um, and fun and an interesting challenge because it's so so dialogue heavy so playing playing with that um yeah that's that's mostly uh what i'm doing I'm, I'm fiddling with an adult novel and i'm fiddling with a new uh middle grade fairy tale sort of retelling uh, wow that I, I love that <laughs> that's also based on the witness protection program oh, i'm all over that fairy tale <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> I have greatly enjoyed my time 
in this discussion with all of you. <laughs> and I want to thank our authors today, as well as all of our viewers for participating in the North Texas Teen Book Festival School Day event. Don't forget to follow us on social media using the hashtag NTTPF22, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Alex, thank you so much.